For the MIGs and the Phantoms, right, we can look up all the stats, all the weapons, all the tactics, and then we have a great game of top trumps. But instead, let's be daring and deep dive into the context of these engagements over Vietnam, as I will argue that the MIG versus F4 duo were more than just dogfights, but they were the catalyst to the modern Western air power we have today. Welcome back to Military Aviation History. My name is Chris and I explain all things air power. New videos every first day on MAD Military Aviation History Day. And this very video is sponsored by our longtime partner. You know them, yes, the one and only United States Naval Institute Press with their fantastic book collection that is coming at you with a hefty discount. Now let's kick in that afterburner and get to the content. First, the combatants, the MiG-21 and the F-4 Phantom II. The MiG-21 was an aircraft optimized for fast and short air-to-air -air interceptions. It was lightweight, supersonic, maneuverable and lightly armed, with just enough range to intercept fighters or bombers. Though it had little endurance and few loadout options, as an interceptor it was exactly what North Vietnam needed. On the other hand, the F-4 Phantom II was not as specialized as the MiG-21. Heavier, although fast, the F-4 origins do herald back to a naval interceptor, but soon it becomes a multi-role workhorse as it became the standardized jet of both the Navy and the Air Force. Though more sophisticated than the MiG-21, its complexities also come with costs and much of the early radar and missile technology performed below expectations. Just like with the MiG-21, the F-4 became the plane it was due to service requirements. A multi-role capable machine that could be set up for air-to-air, air-to-ground, reconnaissance or in a swing role, providing a standardized and flexible machine. If you are a viewer of this channel, nothing in this summary was particularly new to you. You know the MiG-21. You know the F-4 Phantom II. That's exactly the reason why we will now have a deep dive into the wider context where we place these jets and their dogfights and their effectiveness into the force structure they operated in. And we'll have some really cool conclusions coming out of that. Now the Vietnam War was a long war, but I will focus here on the final years, the period of leading up to the 1970s to then the Eastern Offensive of 1972, with the corresponding operations there like Linebacker 1. This is where the most interesting dynamics play out in my opinion. North Vietnam was being able to use a very small fleet effectively to incur significant loss on the US, with the US Air Force and Navy being forced to adapt via not just training, but even operationally and via doctrine. Put simply, the fighting over Vietnam demonstrated that the old way of applying air power simply did not work. Never mind how hard you tried. Vietnam was the layup for that fundamental shift in American and Western air thinking that moved us to the, if we keep in with the metaphor, slam dunk air power we have today. And that story is perfectly symbolized by the duel between, yes, the MiG-21 and the F-4. But it's not about the dogfight, it's about the force as a whole. Let's look at North Vietnam. Though North Vietnam relied heavily on ground-based air defense during the war, it had successfully built up an air force. Just prior to the Easter Offensive in February 1972, North Vietnam now fielded a total force of about 200 MiGs. This fell far short of the US and South Vietnamese numbers, which fielded close to 2,000 aircraft of various types. However, this matters less than we think. Air combat in Vietnam, at least for North Vietnam, played out between smaller formations conducting surgical operations against larger American formations. The focus, for example, on the MiG-19 and the MiG-21 show consistent air-to-air -air specialization in the North Vietnamese Air Force. A lot spoke in favor of North Vietnam's Air Force. Between 1968 to 1972, the North Vietnamese Air Force had completely restructures. Especially after the fighting in 1967, in which we saw the seesaw of changing tactics on either side, that prompts North Vietnam to really focus on systemic rather than tactical changes to counter US strike packages. And in many ways, 
North Vietnam starts to build up an infrastructure from command and control over to airfield dispersal that provided many benefits to their MiG fleet. A new cadre of North Vietnamese fighter pilots was being taught by experienced instructors. New airfields further south near the border to South Vietnam also provided defense in depth and allowed MiGs to be closer to the action as they lacked range. But the main benefit for North Vietnam were of improvements to ground control intercept and signal intelligence, which drastically improved North Vietnam's effectiveness in the air. North Vietnam here built up a high degree of situational awareness for their interceptors and ground control intercept permitted effective routing towards US strike formations. On the textbook level, this was just a commanding operator sitting back in a base uh, who looks basically at a radar picture and draws in information from many different sources, also signal intelligence, and he knows exactly where the US formations are and what these are doing. And these formations are large, of course, and they're spread out. And then that person routes two, three, four MiG interceptors in such a way that they surgically hit a specific element in that US formation. And although it was a reactive force, this centrally guided hit and run tactic and this operational picture disrupted American attacks significantly. While this did, of course, not always work, it allowed North Vietnam to effectively use the limited resources it had in surgical intercepts and apply pressure on a vastly numerically superior force. The MiG-21 is a capable machine in its own right and an important item in all of this, but it is only the second to last element from that chain of well, let's simplify it, right? From the chain of doctrine, force structure, uh, procurement in there as well, training, command, tactics, aircraft, missile, bang. Yeah, we often focus on the machine. We do this because it's the most tangible asset that is available to us. But really, the mix are merely the effector of a very well thought out system. But that's because the whole command and support infrastructure that North Vietnam has built up gives the MiG that ability to be used in such a clever manner. And because of that, although it won't defeat the US, definitely it's inflicting significant losses on the US. And this, this now is the kicker. It's going to ramp up the cost of each strike package to the point where it is no longer sustainable in the long run. So now let's go over to the US to explore that after we do a little barrel roll right into today's sources, because you guys, well, first of all, I love to talk about my sources and you love them as well. So if you want to understand air power and how Vietnam influenced it, you'd be hard pressed to find better books than the ones I'm gonna show you. Now as an executive entry level summary, I would say, Peter Davies, F4 Phantom versus MiG-21, that's a good one. Um, if you want a thorough analysis of American air power during the Vietnam War, look at Brian Leslie's Air Power's Lost Cause. Uh, I have that on ebook. Um, but to get a fantastic perspective here, and I would really highly recommend this from the Vietnamese side, uh, some of this really might surprise you. Get Dong Si Hung's Combat in the Sky. And if you want to really get into the nitty and the gritty with some of with some fantastic articles here looking at the ins and out of air power, check out, well, a couple of books here by John Olson. We have uh, Air Power Applied as well as Air Power Reborn. Uh, those are all in the description, of course. And what do you say? Oh, recommendations are not good enough? Well, your boy has you cover. You are going to get 25% of all these free books right here and the new whole Naval Institute Press's collection uh, all year round with the code MILAVHIS. Yeah, get some air power in your life. What are you waiting for? 25%. It's like the shortest ejection seat marketing pitch I ever had to make. 25% for books. And you get to impress all your friends with your knowledge. It's good to be a nerd and your friends don't even know this, but you're impressing them at 25% off. I mean, personally, I am sold. Twice. Triple sold. Links are in the description. All right, the US. The mix of air and ground defenses that North Vietnam possessed initiated significant tactical and operational changes for the US. I'm going to tackle this in two parts. First, I need to talk about Top Gun because well, it needs to be put into context. And then second, I will talk about the other major changes that occur. All right, cue highway to the danger zone because I'm going in. The 
It's often said that during this period, Top Gun was the go-to solution to fix the problem the US was facing in the air. The popular story and reality don't align. That is not to say that a revamped training program did not provide some sorely needed change. For example, in one standardized questionnaire put to Air Force F-4 pilots on air combat tactics and aircraft systems, it transpired that only 10% of the pilots passed, and the average score was 40%. Although the Navy did somewhat better, its pilots also met far fewer mix in combat. It's also important to acknowledge that this training deficiency was paired with a cultural ethos of gung-ho, must shoot down a MiG pressure on pilots. This had significant repercussions. In fact, there is one frontline US wing commander who even asked for his aircraft, uh, so his aircrafts actually, not to be fitted with new weapon systems, like for example gun pods on the older F-4s that didn't have a gun yet, because he feared that his pilots would just go charging off at the mix and get into situations with mix that are better short in, close in dogfighters that would end really badly. And that man was Robin Olds, yeah, and he was as old school as you can get. If he indicates that the pilots lack a certain training standard paired with a pressure to shoot down MiGs, then you know you've got a problem. So the United States Navy Fighter Weapons School, known as Top Gun, existed since 1969 for the Navy, but it drew heavily on programs that were already going back to the 1950s. And its Air Force counterpart, the Nellis Fighter Weapons School, also existed before that. The problem was not the lack of training facilities, but the curriculum that had not kept up with the times and did not provide sufficient training hours for all the complex aircraft systems or generate a sufficiently team-based tactical approach in pilots. While these changes were rolling out over time, the majority came in the summer of 1972 and were thus too late for pilots already flying in Vietnam. The significance of these training programs was to revise outdated curriculums taking a really good hard look at what works and doesn't work in modern than modern air combat instead of putting not yet earned trust into new technology like missiles and also instilling in pilots an ethos of professional team-based tactics rather than being a hero in the sky all by yourself. We see the origins of the modern fighter pilot right there. Vietnam was the hard resets and how things were done on the pilot level. But this changes how pilots fight once in the air, in a dogfight or missile slugging scenario. Yet, if nothing else changes, it's not going to do much. The whole air power system in Vietnam was flawed. To put it simply then, Top Gun was part of the solution, but it was not the silver bullet. To understand why the US changed, let's look more closely at how air power was applied in Vietnam. Cost and complexity of strikes started to explode. We are in a situation where the US must field a specialized support force of screening long distance and close in escorts, then have electronic warfare support, air defensive suppression, and this formation is sometimes twice if not three times the size of the force that conducts the actual ground strike. Here we do see the advantage of the F-4, as this aircraft started to fulfill a multitude of these roles, compared to earlier strikes, for example during Rolling Thunder. Also, I have not yet included tankers, standoff EW support and search and rescue. Yet even then, a small force of say 2-4 to four MiG-21s, guided by ground control, could sneak in and mess it all up. This was fairly common at the time. Not because the MiG-21 was a better plane, or the North Vietnamese pilots, although very skilled, were better pilots than the American pilots, but because the North Vietnamese system used the strengths of the MiG-21 and the strengths of its ground control interception system to full effect. As we consider this humongous formation, yes, this was the only way to engage a target at the time. But the cost of such a mission, in context for the Vietnam War, in men, material, and pure dollar value for the benefit you got out of them, make it a really tough sell. Put simply, there was no return on investment as strikes were often too high cost for the benefit. This was worsened by the fact that often they were not closely tied into the specific operational goals in the conflict, but used as an independent means to achieve a strategic end, which never occurred. In Vietnam, this didn't provide results. The Air Force and Navy sat down to improve the tactical and operational cost-benefit ratio of air power. This resulted in many major sweeping changes, but I will stick to the tactical level for now. 
The importance was to increase the survivability and precision of these strikes and towards the trailing edge of the war, as more technological changes happened to the aircraft systems, much of this fell squarely on the F-4 Phantom II. The F-4 rebounded, so to say, and began to perform better against the mix, not because of one miracle solution involving a single technology or new training, but because the US went with a comprehensive approach. First, F-4 pilots received much better early warning system, so there's something called Combat Tree, for example, and that allowed them to detect approaching enemy interceptors at far greater ranges and with far greater accuracy, giving better situational awareness and reaction time for incoming mix, increasing the survivability of the formation. Then a shift towards laser-guided ammunitions as they started to appear that generated precision in attacks, increasing the chance of destroyed targets with fewer bombs per target. Third, tighter radio discipline assisted fighter-to-fighter -fighter cooperation, and then fourth and fifth, better electronic warfare support and better suppression of enemy air defenses also help pilots navigate contested environments, again increasing survivability. It's all about getting the planes to the target and back safely. Here we can definitely see tactical benefits to the pilots. And as the years have progressed since Vietnam and technology has become better, some of these tasks would also be compressed upon fewer platforms. Then we extend this to the overall structure of the force. Previously, World War II to Vietnam period here, once fighters were in the air, they were doing their things. Yeah? They were on, out there on their own, including the individual force commanders who had to oversee the whole formation and what it's doing and trying to check in with everybody and so on and so forth during the mission. Towards the end of Vietnam, we now have a sweeping change for the US. Remember how North Vietnam had uh, ground controlled intercept, right, uh, GCI, uh, commanding and then guiding the pilots through the various mission stages. Now, the US started to adopt a adapted version of this. Pilots were now integrated into a communication network of enabling and supporting air and ground based systems that would update pilots and force commanders on enemy locations, enemy strength, send mission data that was critical information over to them and provide overall guidance as well, but without micromanaging the pilots, unlike, for example, in the Soviet bloc and North Vietnamese system. Now we pair this with the big one, the realization that air power must tie into the overall goals of a conflict rather than being seen as its own means to an end. I have a whole video on that right here. And if you, for example, look at Linebacker 1, if you look at the Six Day War, this is where it starts. And in the wake of those operations comes the success of air campaigns like Desert Storm. The associated changes that come out of Vietnam and that we see represented in the F-4 and every Western weapon system in the sky since then, from pilots to equipment over to employment, you know, the tighter cooperation with enabling assets, the technological adjustments, a more moderated attitude to uh, technological leaps, greater teamwork and cooperation among pilots, and just a much more nuanced appreciation of what air power can do on a modern battlefield. That all emanates from here. In short, the MiG-21 versus F-4 duel is symbolic of a cataclysmic change in how the US and the West would conduct air warfare to come. First, the MiG-21 places high pressure on the US because of that contextual advantage it has with the North Vietnamese system and on a tactical level in dogfighting. As a result, the F-4 fleet and the US pilots as a whole reposture, but it's not a singular technological or training change that makes it happen, but it's a comprehensive array of capabilities that increase the survivability as well as the precision of the strike packages. And these advantages then and the re-evaluation of what air power can do and cannot do on a modern battlefield lead to the staggering success that we then of course see in Desert Storm and in, into the air forces we have today. And that means that, in a way, the legacy of the MiG-21 is being the catalyst of today's Western air power, which is kind of ironic. Let me know what you think about this content down below in the comment section. What's your opinion on the MiG-21, the F-4 Phantom, that duo, and uh, what you've heard in this video? Let me know. Also, big thank you here, of course, to the United States Naval Institute Press for sponsoring the video. 25% of on all their books using the code MILABHIS on checkout. 
Thank you to Andrew for his help on the script, as well as Bernard Cast for Military History Visualized for his fire support. All right, supporter and Patreon questions here, coming from you live at Sinsheim in the south of Germany. Visited this place as a tourist, not to do any filming. Uh, it was pretty awesome. Go check it out. They have a Tupolev and a Concorde. Pretty cool. Uh, first question, has the end of the Second World War and the Korean War changed the way we fight our air wars? No. So on the tactical, technical level, absolutely. You know, this introduction of jet engines, of course, big shift. Um, but on the doctrinal level, the way what we, the assumptions that we had on the air war of where and how we wanted to fight, that only changed after Vietnam. Fundamentally, shifts happened then. Now, regarding the question on finding stuff in the German archives, now, a lot of stuff was destroyed at the end of the Second World War, either through bombing or because the Germans destroyed it. And you still find a lot of good stuff, however, I would say. And the best finds are always the ones you don't expect, where a document is in a folder, where thematically it doesn't fit in, but it has a lot of cool information. That's really great. And then the final question, what is the best experience of running this YouTube channel? Look, as corny as it sounds, it is running this YouTube channel. That this is actually possible, right? That something that is funded by the community, watched by the community, exists and is, is possible. You know, I mean, this is, is, is in the end, this is a job for me. So it has to be feasible. But that is, is feasible is the most astonishing, amazing part of it. And if you think back to like 10 to 15 years ago when YouTube was just starting out, None of this could have happened because it was the big media corporations that were deciding what sort of documentaries get made and the stuff that I put out, they would have just thrown out of the window because they would have said, oh, nobody watches this. Well, we together proved them wrong. So big thank you to all of you and of course to the patrons and channel members for supporting this sort of content. And as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.